Good morning. Welcome to CCF. Don't mind the bike. It's Andrews. He's nine years old. It's the only bike I could throw into the car early this morning to get here. Why am I riding a bike at the beginning of the service? It's because I remember when I was younger, my dad gave an example. He said, in life, you have to keep moving. You have to keep growing. The moment you stop, the moment you stop, what happens? You fall. And a lot of us, let me put this down here. A lot of us, when we fall, we stay down, we get discouraged, and we forget that we gotta get back up and we gotta keep on growing. This is the last message on the series, Finish Well. You remember last week? To finish well, you have to have faith. You have to believe. You have to have faith in God's promises no matter what. We looked at Abraham. Today, we're gonna look at, to finish well, you need to keep on growing. Can you say that with me? Keep on growing, right? You gotta keep growing in every aspect of your life. Not physically getting bigger, right? But you have to grow physically. You know, the last two months have been very hard for me to exercise because I hurt my shoulder doing something really stupid. I'm not gonna share what I did, but it's been hurting, it still hurts. And I've stopped exercising. And I told myself, this is ridiculous. Why am I stopping exercising? Because I have pain in my body when I wake up. I have to keep on exercising. If not, I'm not gonna finish well. My health will, will give in, right? You gotta finish, you gotta keep on, keep on growing mentally also. Your mind, it's easy to, to check out. And you know, I'm done school, I don't need to keep growing. You have to keep growing in every aspect of life, especially spiritually. And so today, we're gonna be looking at uh, the Apostle Peter, and I love his life because I can relate to him. How many of you have ever failed in life? You failed, maybe in school, you failed a test, maybe you failed uh, an entire course, maybe you failed an entire year. I met somebody yesterday and he said it took him nine years to finish college because he kept failing, because he wasn't going to school, he wasn't going to class. How many of you have failed in your career? You know, you've worked so hard to get that promotion or you've um, you made a mistake in your work and somehow you didn't get that promotion or you lost your job. Um, you know what it's like, right? How many of you have failed in business or you're in a business right now that's, that's failing? You know, what, one of the, the most painful things when it comes to failing is not so much maybe even the athletics or the studies, but in your relationships that matter most to you, it's very tough when you feel like you've, you've failed. We were at a family retreat very recently, and I don't know if you guys remember this, but remember there was a Q&A, and there was a dad that stood up, and he said, you know, I've been listening to these messages, and honestly, I, I've, not, I've not been doing any of this. In essence, he was saying, I failed as a dad. And his question was, is there hope for me? The thing about failure, falling down, is if you're a normal person, when you're going through it, you will hear lies from Satan. Some of the lies that I've heard is, you know why you're failing? failing? It's because that's who you are. You're just a failure. Then he'll start recounting different things in my life. You know, you failed as a basketball player. You never won a championship. Your sister did. You didn't. You know, you failed in this business. You failed in that business. You failed in this. You failed in this. And so, in my own mind, the noise that comes in is, I'm a failure. And it's so discouraging. But I have great message for you today. I have great hope for you today. Through the life of Peter, we're going to look at it together, and we're going to see that Peter had ups and downs, but Peter finished well. He kept on growing. 
So can I pray for all of us? Can I ask you to stand up and pray with me? Let's all stand up and commit this time to the Lord once again in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your people here. This is your flock, Lord. And your people here are here because they love you. They want to learn more about you. They want to they finish well. I know we all want to finish well. And Lord, I know that we, are, we wrestle with failure in our own life, the times that we do fall down. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you be the one to speak in and through me today. You be the one to speak to the hearts of your people here. That as we look at your scripture, as we hear the testimony, Lord, your, your word and your message will be conveyed straight to our hearts. And that you would use this message, Lord, to transform us. Help us to be like the Apostle Peter who finished well. I pray you protect us from any distraction. I pray for those who are watching online. Help us to give this time completely to you, Lord, to focus, to not allow any distractions that we have at home or wherever we are to distract us. And we ask that you protect us also from the attacks of Satan. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can sit down. There are three, three points we're going to be looking at today. Let me get my clicker here. Here. To finish well, we need to say, say this with me, grow, grow from your failure, grow in your humility, grow by God's grace. And our memory verse is this, read it with me. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard. Why be on your guard? Because the entire book of 2 Peter is about false teaching, false prophets, it's, it's about What's happening in our world today? You have so many different ideologies, so many, so many contradictory worldviews to what God says. He says, be on your guard. Because if you're not on your guard, you're going to be like me who stops on the bike and falls. Be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow, read this with me, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So who was the Apostle Peter? An amazing man. I want to begin, take you back to Luke chapter 5. And it's a very interesting passage because um, one of the theologians was saying, this is not the first time Peter met Jesus. And Peter, like I said, represents us. You're here today at this church or you're listening online and you're going to be hearing about Jesus. And maybe, like Peter, this is not the first time you've heard about Jesus. But Peter was on a journey. You know, Peter saw Jesus heal his mother-in-law. Peter got to know Jesus through Andrew. But look at what happens in this encounter with Jesus. Look what happens to Peter. And this is my prayer for all of us here today. That we would enter into a relationship with Jesus just like Peter did. Let's read it together. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, around Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. For those of you who went to the Holy Land, that is the Sea of Galilee. He was standing there, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. So the boats had come back from fishing all night. They were at the side, and Jesus saw them. And so Jesus got into one, one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little way from the, from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Why do you think Jesus had to get on the boat? It says because they were crowding around him, right? If you can imagine Jesus standing here and all of you are trying to crowd around Jesus, Jesus needs to step back. He needed to get on the boat so he could, he could actually speak to everybody that was listening. And that's what he asked Peter to do, and Peter did it. When he had finished speaking, after he had taught the people, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. He said, come on, Peter, let's go fishing. Now, who's the fisherman? Peter is. What was Jesus' profession? Carpenter. You have a carpenter telling a fisherman what to do. Now, what does Peter say? Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. He was probably 
rolling his eyes inside his head, right? Children, have you ever done that to your parents? Have you ever done that to your parents? I think my children roll, around, roll their eyes sometimes at us, but they're good kids, and they're not here. They're at a sports camp, so I can talk about them. No. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. Peter, when he listened to Jesus, experienced an amazing miracle. I want you to imagine that. That is your profession. That is your business. And you went out, and you caught nothing that night. And all of a sudden, all these fish are flapping in the nets. Will you be excited? Oh, yeah. Sulit yung paglabas, di ba? I listened to Jesus, and wow, I have all this fish. There was so much fish that, the, fish that they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats. Both boats were full, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. What happened in Peter's heart this time around? Somehow, some way, God used that miracle to speak deeply into Peter's life. Peter recognized this is not an ordinary man. I'm the fisherman. I know what's supposed to happen. But somehow, when I followed Jesus, I experienced this miracle. You know, when you see Jesus for who he really is, it helps you understand who you really are. And Peter came to that point in his life that he said, I am a sinful man. Lord, I don't, I don't deserve to be here. And look what Jesus said. Amazement had seized Peter and his companions because of the catch of fish. And so also were James, son, uh, James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. Did Peter come to the point of surrender to Jesus in this story? He did. How do you know? Look at the next line. Remember, this is his business. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed Jesus. My prayer is, is that as you listen to this message, I don't know where you are at in your journey with Jesus. I believe some of you have heard Jesus I believe all of you have heard about Jesus before because of the country that we were born into. But my prayer is that you will encounter Jesus the same way that Peter encountered Jesus. But you see, it's very interesting. It's very interesting because Peter, even though he encountered Jesus and experienced so many things, what were some of the miracles that Peter experienced? He did some amazing, he did some amazing things like, you remember Peter walked on water? Remember that? He was the only disciple that got out of the boat. He walked on water. I'm not going to read the verse anymore. I'm just, showing it, I'm just showing it there for you. What else did Peter do? Peter recognized who Jesus was. He said, you are... Sorry, I overclicked. There. Peter recognized who Je Peter... Peter walked on water, deja vu. <laughs> Peter recognized who Jesus is. It says here, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Peter also was there when Jesus was transfi transfigured, right? With Moses, Peter was there. But you know, Peter also had lows. You know, when you give your life to Jesus and you start walking with him, you're going to have highs, you're going to have lows. What were some of Peter's lows? Peter was actually rebuked by Jesus. He says, one moment Peter is speaking as if he's, an, you know, the spirit of God is really with him. Jesus says, you didn't, you didn't say this on your own. But another moment, Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. And you know... When did Peter's greatest fall come? Was it at the beginning of his relationship with Jesus? No, it was towards the end. He was with Jesus three years already. 
as you and I mature in our relationship with Christ, we're supposed to become stronger, right? But is it possible that as you grow older in your relationship with Jesus, that maybe you follow Jesus not as closely as you did before? Is it possible to love Jesus less than you did when you first came to faith in him? Is it possible that you don't obey Jesus as completely as you did before? And the answer is yes, it's possible. And that's what happened to Peter. Peter denied Jesus how many times? Three times. You know, in, in sin, and I got this from Colin Smith, sin always has two components. You have the wayward part of sin. What's the wayward part of sin? You're driving down Edsa, right? Somebody cuts you off. You lose your temper. You say a bad word. You were caught off guard. Or you see a poster and the, the picture grabs your interest and you start lusting. Or you're on the internet and something comes on and you click on it. That's the wayward. But every sin also has the willful. Who clicked on it? You made a decision to click on it, right? The interesting thing is, the initial sin may have been something that was wayward. You were caught off guard in a moment of weakness. But somehow, we have a, a, a way of going back to that sin. And the wayward becomes willful. And the more willful the sin is, the darker, the deeper, and the more difficult it is to get out of that sin. Look at Peter, the first time he denied Jesus. Maybe he was caught off guard, right? He was like, he was a little shocked. What did he say? But he denied it before them saying, I do not know what you are talking about. The second time he denied Jesus, and again, he denied it, but this time with an oath. He added to what he had said before. And he says, I don't know the man. Look at the third time Peter denied Jesus. Then he began to curse and swear. Boop, 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 boop. I, <laughs> I'm glad you think it's funny. <laughs> I, I don't know the man, right? So Colin Smith, I was listening to this message, he said, we need to repent before the wayward becomes willful. The other day I was, um, my wife came into the room and she said, what are you looking at? Because I was on my phone. And the wayward, right? What's the wayward? Kind of like, wh why is she asking me? What am I looking at? And I, I, I blurted out, nothing. I'm not looking at anything. Nothing, you know? Nothing. But I was reading something. And I was thinking about, I was preparing for this message, thinking about the wayward and the willful. I may have been caught off guard, but if I don't make right what I chose to say, that's willful. And if it's willful, I may go back to it and get into that cycle that becomes darker, deeper, and more difficult to get out of. So I humbled myself. I said, sweetie, actually, when you asked me if I was looking at something, I was actually reading this, and I showed her what I was reading. It wasn't porn, but, you know, it's, it's stuff that I, I didn't need to be reading. And I praise God, because when you are open and honest and you repent before the willful becomes, before the wayward becomes willful, God gives you grace to get out of it. So Peter, he fell. He fell from, from, from here all the way down here. He denied Jesus. But what's the message today? Keep on growing. What's the first point? You need to grow from your failure. Grow from your failure. Just because you failed doesn't mean you're going to grow. Some people fail and fail and fail and fail again because they don't grow. Nine years in college, right? But if you want to keep on growing, you have to grow from your failure. So let's try to understand what happened to Peter. Remember, failure isn't final. That's a lie. That's a lie that you are a failure. That is not your destiny. In Christ, your destiny is victory. Your destiny is a new life. The old has gone, the new has come. There is victory in Jesus in every aspect of your life. Amen? So how do we grow from failure? Where did Peter 
fall. How did Peter fall? Let's look at John 13. Simon said to, said to him, Lord, where you are going, where are you going? Jesus said, answered, where I go, you cannot follow me, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I not follow right now? I will lay down my life for you. Can you say that with me? I will lay down my life for you. If you're a coach, okay, you're a coach, any sport, and your player tells you, coach, I'm going to lay down my life for you. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play as if this is, this is the game of my life. Are you going to give that player playing time if you really see it in him? Of course, because I don't know the translation in English, but in Tagalog, it's buo yung loob. Your inside is full, complete, right? That's the English translation. Now, Peter, for those of you who like to play poker, not for betting, just for fun, right? Texas Holden, Holden, you know the game? When you are sure you're going to win, or maybe you're just so desperate and you're hoping to win, what do you say and you only have, a, you, you have these group of chips that you have? I'm all in, right? You put it all in with confidence because you want people to get scared. But depending on who you are, people know you and they know you're bluffing or whatnot, but I'm all in. Was Peter all in? He was. Peter had a willing spirit. A willing spirit is a sign of spiritual maturity. But see, Jesus says, your spirit is willing, but, you're, but the flesh is weak. And you see, Peter, he overestimated the power of a willing spirit, and he underestimated the power of his reluctant flesh. And that's where you and I get in trouble. We overestimate the power of a willing spirit. I believe all of you here have a willing spirit because you can be doing something else on a Sunday, but you came to worship God. You have a willing spirit. But maybe we underestimate the power of the reluctant flesh. I didn't make that up. That's from Colin Smith. But it's wonderful. I love it. So, how did Peter learn from his failure? Let's understand what was it that Peter struggled with? Pride. You know, something that will tempt all of us, no matter what season you are in your relationship with God. In fact, the more senior you become in your walk with the Lord, the more this temptation becomes a struggle. Just like Peter. It wasn't early on in his, in his relationship with Jesus. This is the struggle of pride. Let's see. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. What is one of the signs of spiritual pride or pride? What did Peter say? Even though all may fall away, because of you, I will never fall away. You know, the moment you feel you are stronger and better than others, the moment you feel you are stronger and better than others, that's already a sign of pride. You look around you and you think, I serve more, I give more, I know more. I'm better than the person beside me or that person over there. Pride. What else? Jesus said, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. This is a biblical prophecy written hundreds of years before Jesus came. Jesus says, all of you will fall away. The moment, the moment you hear Jesus' message, the words of Jesus for someone else. Like today, you may, be, you may be sitting here and saying, oh, this is a great message. He's talking about pride. This is a great message for him, the person beside you, or for my dad, or for my daughter, or for my son, or for my friend. The moment you hear Jesus' message for someone else, that's already a sign of pride. Another sign of pride. He came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for even an hour? 
What did, what did Jesus say? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The moment you and I no longer need to pray, the longer you feel, I don't need to pray. I'm okay. And maybe you will never say that. But if you look at your own life today, if I look at my own life, how much time do I spend praying? If I'm not praying, even though I don't say it, this is what I believe. I don't need to pray. That's so why I want to encourage you, prayer and fasting. It's a great way to pray corporately together. It's coming up in July. Let's make the time because we need Jesus. I need Jesus. Peter needed Jesus. So what are the three signs? You feel you're stronger and better than others. You hear the words of Jesus for someone else and you no longer need to pray. Peter fell. All of us, if we have the same mindset, we will fall also. So you need to grow from your mistakes, whatever it is. You know, one last example about growing from a mistake because I, I saw a brother here and we were just talking the other day. You know, health-wise, right? You get your blood work, right? You get your blood work, and then your blood work shows that you have this, 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 and that. So one of the things that the blood work was showing my friend is he has fatty liver. And so we were talking, you know, they were asking us, and I say us, you know, me, my, my wife, and then my, my sister, we were all sitting together, my brother-in-law, and we're, we're quack doctors. Because when, when, when our friend was asking us, how do you deal with a fatty liver? Oh, does your brother have fatty liver? Mm-hmm. Your father? Uh-huh. Oh, it's genetic. You're just, you have fatty liver. Sorry. <laughs> Terrible advice. This week he got his results. He's like, guess what? I no longer have fatty liver. Because he had been making lifestyle changes. He had stopped eating pork and beef. Started exercising. He did something about it. How do you learn from your failure? You do something about it. Don't just say, oh, this is my destiny. Genetically, I have fatty liver. I'm, I'm just going to continue to eat lechon because lechon likes me. I mean, I like lechon. <laughs> Learn. Grow from your mistakes. Did Peter grow from his mistakes? Let's see. You know, the second point of keeping, keep on growing, we need to grow in your humility. Why is it important that you grow in humility? If you're proud, will you grow? No because you think you have it all together. There's no room for improvement. And somebody said this, right? What's the biggest room in the room? Not this hall, but the room for improvement. That's true for everyone. But if you don't see yourself for who you really are, your need to keep on growing, you're not gonna grow because you know it all. So let's see, did Peter learn? Did he learn from his mistake? He did. How do we know? Look at Second, First Peter chapter 5. He wrote this letter. He said, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is, oh, read this with me, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. And what is one evidence of humility? Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I met an another guy yesterday, and the reason why I met a lot of people yesterday is because I was at a sports camp yesterday talking to a lot of the volunteers. This guy was diagnosed with bipolar 2. He was depressed, anxiety on meds. And he was sharing with us during the, de during the devotion how he came to a point of his life where he didn't like what the meds were doing to his body, to his, to his state of mind. And he humbled himself before God. He cast all his anxiety upon Jesus. And I said, hey, can you give me more details? How did you do that? Because I know there's so many people who are struggling with anxiety and depression. And I, I want to know what you actually did. But the short version of the story is he is no longer on medicine. He is on fire for God. He said one of the things that he did is he started serving God, right? Loving God, serving God. 
He's one of the volunteers at the sports camp. And he's having a tremendous impact in the lives of the kids that are there. We need to grow in humility. Peter learned. How do we know he learned? Not just because he wrote about it. Anybody can say anything, right? You can say something. Doesn't mean you've learned it. Look at his life. In the book of Galatians, and Paul wrote the book of Galatians, but when Cephas came to Antioch, Paul said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. What was happening here? Peter, he understands that there's no longer Jew, no longer Greek, no longer, no, no longer Gentile. There's, we're one. In Christ, we are all one. Race doesn't separate us, right? Male, female, we are, we are one. There is, there is unity in Christ. But somehow Peter had been hanging out with people who were, who were going back to the legalistic way. And he was drawn into that. You know, I'm reminded, you may have convictions about certain things, but if you, if your best friends are making you compromise, make decisions, or shift your, your thinking and your view towards something that is not biblical, you better watch out. Because the Bible says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So Paul had to correct Peter. And what happened? The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. Peter's example led others to fall into the hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, today you need to be straightforward, right? At the sports camp, we talked about God's design. God designed us as a human being. He gave us an identity. We are children of God when we're in Christ. He gave us a gender. We're either male or female. God designed sex. Sex is a beautiful thing in the context of marriage. He designed sex for marriage. There are so many different views today when it comes to those things. And we need to speak the truth. And that's what the Apostle Paul did in Peter's life. If you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the, the Gentiles to live like Jesus? The issue here was legalism, different from what it is today. But same principle. How do we know Peter learned his lesson? How do we know Peter grew in humility? Look at what he wrote at the end of the second book, 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 14, 16, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, just as also our beloved brother Paul. How did he call Paul? That self-righteous, uh, you know, spiritual gift of critical correction guy. Remember that guy, Paul? No, he didn't say that. He said, our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him. He elevated Paul, wrote to you. And he, in the next verses, he talks about how Paul's writings are, are amazing. Actually, sometimes so amazing, it's actually hard to understand, Peter said. But he, it's not, it's not a, a dig at Paul. It was, it was affirming who Paul is. Peter learned to take correction. Who is the hardest person to hear correction from in your life? Who is it? Be honest. Who is it? Maybe if you're a child, it's your parents. Maybe if you're a, a spouse, who is it? If you're, if you're married, who is it? Well, for me, you know, it's that beautiful lady over there, the blonde one, yes, she's amazing. But somehow, when she has something to help me improve, I don't want to hear it, right? Why not? Because... In Tagalog, mayabang kasi ako. <laughs> mayabang. In English, it's my pride. But I'm learning to grow in humility. I should welcome correction. How you respond to correction is a good indicator if you are growing in humility or not. So if you think you're, you are humble, 
well, how are you responding when you get corrected from anybody, especially the people that's hard? By the way, I love my wife. She's amazing. Jenny, thank you for correcting me. Please continue to correct me. Peter had the Holy Spirit. You can't grow in humility without the Holy Spirit. It's supernatural. And the Holy Spirit says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses where? Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. What's our message today? To finish well? What? You forgot already? Remember the bike? Keep on, not moving, growing. Can you say it at the back there? Keep on growing. We need to grow from our mistakes. We need to grow in our humility. And our last point, we need to grow by God's grace. By God's grace. Let's welcome our brother, Mr. Carlo Mercado, to share with us how God's grace became very real in his life. Let's welcome him, guys. Self-centered, a remorseless liar, a troublemaker, a womanizer, and an alcoholic in denial. This described the kind of person I was when I got my then-girlfriend pregnant at the age of 22. About two years later, we separated, and I became an absentee father to my daughter. I hardly visited and was challenged at times to provide financial support. Sometime later, I dated another girl whom I had planned to propose to despite our toxic relationship. I thought marriage would make things better for us. But a day before my proposal, I discovered she was seeing someone else behind my back. So we broke up. A few weeks later at my birthday party, a woman next to our table was introduced to me by a common friend. Her name is April. Even though I was hurting from my recent breakup, April and I eventually started dating. After only two months, we learned that she was pregnant. Given the situation, we decided to um, live together, thinking that it was the responsible thing to do. But due to my persistent bad habits and behavior, our relations soon became toxic as well. We broke up and got back together so many times and it, and it felt like I was in an endless cycle. My misery and confusion led me to attend CCF Sunday services where some of my relatives were attending. In the middle of the cycle of breaking up and getting back together, April became pregnant once again, this time with twin boys. During that pregnancy, I encouraged her to attend the Sunday services with me as well. Yes, we were attending, but not convicted about living in sin. Thus, we continued to struggle as a couple while I remained indulged in my vices and continued a double life. In December 2018, after Christmas, we had this emotional argument and I decided to leave April and our kids, a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old twin boys. Honestly, I didn't want to add even one fatherless to the world, but then it looked like I was already making four. I dropped off my stuff at my mom's place and went to a bar, got wasted. Not wanting to ruin my family's holiday, I impulsively decided to go to Perte Galera alone with just a mobile phone and some money in my pocket. And so I traveled there. For the three days on the island, I would eat, drink alcohol, casually talk to people, recount all my failures, and then return to my rented room drunk. 
only to wake up the next morning to emptiness and worthlessness and repeat the process in the hope of escaping the despair. On New Year's Eve, I woke up very early and made the decision to return to my mom's place since I could no longer handle the depression. However, it began to rain heavily and all the boat rides to Batangas bus terminal was cancelled. I asked God why. But I eventually realized that He wasn't done breaking me yet. Trapped on the island, I watched the people celebrate with their families and friends by the beach as I welcomed the new year by myself. It was the first day of 2019 when I woke up alone in the small room with extreme loneliness. The sadness overwhelmed me and I broke down in tears before God. I acknowledged that I could no longer run my life my way. I gave up and humbly surren surrendered my life to the Lord. That was my turning point. As soon as I arrived at my mom's place, I searched for CCFD groups in Makati. Gino Rodriguez became my D group leader. The process of developing my relationship with Jesus started with a ton of praying, studying God's word, and having fellowship with other committed Christ followers. I got water baptized at True Life 8 Retreat. Then I experienced the Holy Spirit's regular convictions and discipline while serving in ministries and witnessing to others. I clearly saw changes happening in my life that I never imagined could happen. I even did mission work until the pandemic lockdown put our activities on hold. I thought April still had not forgiven me. Oh, despite, however, in spite of, our, of my spiritual victories, my family life was still not in order. I thought April still had not forgiven me for my mistakes and felt that the relationship may have been damaged beyond repair. Although it was already a hopeless case for me, I still prayed that April would one day marry a godly man, someone who would love her as how Jesus loves his church for her and our kids, uh, kids' sake. In January 2021, after being chaotic for more than two years, April allowed me to talk to her and the kids again. This time, instead of being arrogant and play the blame game, I practiced the principles of being slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger, and would constantly share anything about my faith. I found out that April had been praying for me all along. Her specific prayer was for God to change me, so I so that I could be the husband and father God wanted me to be. Over the following weeks, God led us to forgive one another. And He restored my relationship with April and my kids. Once more, I returned to my family. But this time, Jesus was with me. No longer a cycle. <laughs> He alone can turn brokenness into a blessing. After some time, we both agreed to finally honor God in our partnership. I surprised April with a marriage proposal in front of both our families. And she said yes. Looking back, God heard and answered our prayers. We attended premarital counseling or PMC online at CCF Makati twice led by Pastor Ronnie Disipolo to align us with God's design for marriage. Amazingly, April personally decided to commit, commit herself to Jesus first before committing herself to me. And so, she publicly declared her faith in Christ through water baptism. I baptized my wife to, to be the dawn before our wedding. That afternoon, in the midst of pandemic, we got married. Praise God. 
By God's grace, my wife and I are now leading a couples day group, volunteering as premarital counselors, and being involved in a few ministries. More importantly, we are committed to raising our kids in the ways of the Lord, including my 17-year-old daughter who lives with her mom. And finally, on the exact day of our first wedding anniversary, God bless our marriage with another pregnancy, an additional son born just two weeks ago for us to love and point to Jesus. My name is Carlo Mercado, a sinner whose life was transformed through brokenness by God's grace alone. To him be all the glory, honor, and praise. Praise God. Praise God, brother. Praise God. That is a picture of God's grace. And I, I would like the family to please stand up. April, I know you're there. And all the kids, all the children, please stand up. We want to pray for this family. I know you have a two-week baby. Amazing, huh? Two weeks. And she's out here with us. She was with us last night also. Um, let's bow our heads. Let's raise our hands towards uh, uh, the family. So wherever you are, you can put your hands on them also. And we just want to lift up to you um, this family. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this amazing testimony. Thank you, Lord, for Carlo. Thank you for April. Thank you that in your grace, you have created a hunger, a thirst for you. Not just for Carlo, but for his entire family. And Lord, just like Peter came to the point in his life where he acknowledged his need for you. We thank you for Carlo and April surrendering their lives completely to you first before getting married. We thank you for this family. We thank you for how you redeem the decisions that we've made in the past, how you redeem the moments in our life when we think are hopeless, but you've brought this family together and we rejoice and we celebrate your goodness and your power in their life. And now we pray for your protection. Lord, bless them as they continue to serve you as D-group leaders, as they serve you as counselors for premarital counseling. I pray for their family, for all their children, Jesus, that they would grow up not just knowing about you, but they would keep on growing in grace and knowledge of who you are and love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. What's the message today? Keep on growing. Failure isn't final. In Jesus, he redeems the messiest and most challenging seasons of our life God can use for his good. As we wrap up, the Apostle Paul, he says, by the grace of God, we can read it together, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. It's God's grace. The reason why you're here today is not because somebody invited you, it's because of God's grace. The reason why we're still following Jesus today is because of his grace. And the reason why you will serve God for the rest of your life it's because of God's grace. The Apostle Paul understood the grace of God. To grow by God's grace is you understand everything that Jesus has done for you. The reason why Carlo and all of us got emotional is because that is the grace of God and it keeps you going. Look at what Apostle Paul says in Philippians. I am confident of this very thing that he, Jesus, who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. It is Jesus. You know, Jesus appeared to the disciples several times, right? After he, he was, remember Peter denied him? So we're going back to Peter's story. Peter denied him. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. And we know he rose again because he appeared to the, to the disciples. And what did he do when he first encountered Peter? Did Jesus remind Peter of his failure? No, he didn't. Jesus showed grace. When we are with people who have harmed us, are we gracious or do we immediately point out 
the very thing that we are not happy about in their life. We can learn a thing or two from Jesus. But look at how Jesus responded when he first met and encountered the disciples. It was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, there were, the doors were shut because the disciples were hiding <coughs> for fear of the Jews. They were hiding for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, what did he say? Peace be with you. Shalom, right? Shalom is God's perfect design for what our world is supposed to be. It's a perfect design for what, who you are supposed to be. Shalom, peace be with you. And Jesus could say that because it is connected to what he did on the cross. It is finished. Yes, we live in a broken world, but because of what Jesus did, he comes and says, peace be with you. And how many times did he say, peace be with you? It says, when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They were so happy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. He's commissioning them. And then after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas this time with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said what? Peace be with you. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus say, peace be with you? Three times. God's grace. You know what's God's, what God's grace is? God's grace is that it is he himself that restores us when we fall. It is he himself that picks up the broken pieces in our lives. We have made bad decisions that have impacted our families. Spiritually, you may be a shipwreck right now. You have turned away from God. Who is the one who's going to restore you? Say it with me. Who? It's Jesus. How do we know that? Look at what Peter said. In 1 Peter, Peter says, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of what? All grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You know, Jesus uses people today. He uses people to encourage others, but it's Jesus working through that person. One of the guys in the sports camp, we were talking <clears throat> about his own journey with God, and he reminded me that there was a time in his life that he had, he had been drug-free for so many years, but during the pandemic, things had just been so difficult that he actually got back into drugs. And we were on a hike together, and I, I couldn't remember all the details, so he was reminding me. We were on a hike together in Tanai, and it was during that hike that he was able to open up to me and to some of the other guys that were hiking with him. And God used that moment in his life to turn him around. He became honest with his wife. The wife forgave him. And both of them, with their daughter, was at the sports camp, are at the sports camp now, serving God. And the wife, you know, she said, this guy, he walks with God every day. I have the deepest respect for this man. And that's so encouraging to hear, knowing what had happened in his life, how God has restored him. Who restored him? It wasn't the guys that were walking with him in the in Tanai. God used those guys, but it was Jesus restoring him. Who's going to restore you? It's Jesus. And we, we now end with where we, where we began. We began with the Sea of Galilee. Remember? When Jesus encountered the miracle, he had caught no fish the night before, and Jesus said, cast your, your, the nets on the other side. And so we end now, again, Sea of Galilee. Some theologians think this was probably the similar place where Peter had encountered Jesus that time and surrendered his life to Jesus. But this time, Peter and the disciples are fishing on their own. They went out fishing again. And again, the same thing, they did not catch anything. And somebody from the shore said, hey, guys, Throw the net on the other side. And they threw the net on the other side. And all of a sudden, so much fish again. And then Peter said, I remember this. He says, that's, that's Jesus. He took off his, his clothes and he jumped, jumped in the water. He swam to shore and sure enough, it was Jesus. Jesus was there to restore Peter. 
personally, they had breakfast together with the other disciples, and now they had finished breakfast, and then Jesus pulls Peter aside. And he has this amazing conversation with Peter. He says, Peter, when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? The Greek word for that is, do you agape me? Do you have this highest standard of love, unconditional love? The love that God has for us is agape love. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I phileo you, brotherly love, still love, but not quite agape love. But you know I love you. Peter had learned his lesson. He didn't say, yes, Lord, I love you most. I love you more than all these disciples. I, I am the man. No, Peter, needed, he, Peter need, needed to learn that lesson. How could Jesus entrust Peter with a flock if he, ha, if he was not humble? A proud person will crush the flock. A humble person can lead and shepherd the flock. And then he goes again. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, Jesus said, do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Phileo you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you, phileo, do you love me? And this time Jesus changed the word. He says, do you love me? Brotherly love, like the one that you're telling me. Jesus knows the answer. Peter, Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You know I phileo you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now you can read a lot of commentaries that say a lot of different things about this. But the point that I want to drive home is this. It was Jesus who went out of his way to not just restore P Peter, but to commission Peter. And Jesus is saying, you want to be used by me? You have to love me. Okay, you may not have agape love, but that is the kind of love that we should all have for, for each other. But whatever love you have right now, I'll take it. You love me. I know you love me. And it's interesting because he says, tend my lamb, shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep. What stands out here for you? Whose sheep are they? Whose sheep? Are they Peter's sheep? No. How many of you are D group leaders? Can you raise your hand? Or you're part of a small group? You're a D group leader or you're part of a small group? Raise your hand. So there's still a lot of you who are not part of a small group and who are not leading. My prayer is that as you understand the grace of God, you will understand that the grace of God, just like what it did in Peter, leads you, leads you to love God in a way that you live your life for God. And, and God commissioned Peter. This wasn't the only time he commissioned him. Remember the Great Commission? What's CCS verse? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Jesus commissioned the disciples. This is a personal commission. And I pray as we end this message, the message is what? Keep on growing. You grow from your failure, grow in your humility, and you grow in God's grace. Part of growing in God's grace is living a life in response to all that God has done for you. Serving him. Last verse. But grow in the grace of knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our memory verse. To him be the glory both now and to the days of eternity. Amen. When you live a life like this, you bring glory and honor to God. There is one last, last verse, and it's this. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, as you, this is the message, finish well, you grow, in, grow from your failure, grow in your humility, grow by God's grace. But Peter, did he finish well? He did. In that same time that Jesus was talking to Peter, the verses afterwards talk about how Peter was going to die. Jesus was telling Peter, you're going to follow my, in my way. But Peter chose not to be crucified the same way as Jesus because he felt he was unworthy to, 
die the same way Jesus died. So he was crucified upside down. And it was as if Jesus was telling him, look, you denied me three times, but look, I am commissioning you. You are upon this rock. I'll build my church. You are the guy. And you are actually going to die for me. It was a, a powerful word that Jesus gave Peter. And I want to encourage you guys. That we are living in a world where many people are falling and turning away from God. But I believe if you, if you embrace God's grace, let it transform you, you will finish well. Keep on growing. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the life of Peter. And Lord, as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed down, Lord, I, I, I can't help but, thinking, but think of that moment in our life. In the near future, I say near because any of us can go anytime. And as I think about that near future, I know the time will come when all of us here will stand before your throne. And I want you right now, all of you who are listening to this message, wherever you are, to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine you are standing before the throne of God. This is it. Your life on earth is over. You are now face to face with Jesus. What would he say to you right now? Let's say we all died right now and we were before Jesus. What would he say to you right now? Would he say, well done, good and faithful servant? You were faithful with a few things. I now entrust you with many things. Maybe you're terrified at that thought of being at the throne of Jesus right now. If you are, remember what Jesus told Peter. Do not fear. From now on, I will make you fishers of men. If you're at a point in your life and you are afraid to meet your maker because there are things that you have not surrendered to God, Jesus is not yet your Lord and Savior, then I want you to pray with me right now. Something like this, Lord, I'm terrified at the thought of meeting you face to face. I, I have lived my life my way, Lord. I, I've heard about you, I know about you, but you're not my Lord. But just like Peter, Lord, I, I understand who you are, how gracious and how powerful you are. You, you died on the cross for me. And at this point in my life, I humble myself before you. I open the door of my heart and I receive you, Jesus, to come into my life, to be my Lord, to be my master, to be my savior. Just like Carlo humbled himself before you, I want to do the same. And I thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart, for forgiving me of all my sins and for your promise of eternal life. I no longer have to be afraid. And Lord, I pray that you make me a fisher of men, fisher of women, because that's what, what, that's what you created me for. And Lord, for the rest of us who know that we're going to spend eternity with you because we have you in our life. Maybe like Peter, Lord, we have followed you less closely. We have followed you less completely. We have allowed sin in our life. And we got to get back up, Lord. We got to keep on growing. So wherever you are, whatever you're going through, I want you to pray with me also right now. Lord, you know what's going on in my heart. You know the failure that I'm dealing with, whether it be a spiritual failure, um, failure in my family, failure at work. Father, thank you that you are the restorer. It is you that will enable me. It is your grace that will enable me to come back to you and to walk faithfully with you. And so I surrender my life once again to you, everything, Lord, all the mistakes I've made, and Lord, I pray you help me to keep on growing. Thank you that it is you that will take me to the finish line. And Lord Jesus, I look forward to the day where all of us will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, before you go, before you go, next week we're starting a new series. And the series is about how do you handle, how do you deal with problems? So my dad will be kicking off that, that series. So please bring your friends. We'll be looking at the most problematic church um, in the Bible, Church of Corinth. So it'll be a great time for us to continue to grow. God bless you guys and keep on growing.